we're generating right now five billion of cash a year at least. So it's a hundred million bucks every week. And uh, you know, just not, we've been talking here half an hour and I haven't done a damn thing. Warren discusses the investment climate during the 20th century and what the stock market returns were like during that time. The whole century is quite interesting. If you take the 20th century, it was an unbelievable century for the United States. The GDP per capita, and that's the way to think of it as per capita. Sometimes they talk about our GDP versus Europe. But if their population is the same every year and ours goes up 1%, you got to have a divisor as well as a numerator. And GDP per capita in the 20th century in the United States went up 610%. Actually, qualitatively, it went up far more than that because you can't really measure certain things in medicine or whatever it may be and improvements. But just on a quantitative basis, it went up every single decade, including the decade of the 30s. So here you had 100 years when basically the U.S. citizenry was improving their lot decade by decade. The 30s, it was up 13%. Best decade was World War II. The, 90s, the 40s, it was up 36%. The worst decade was the First World War. It was a huge period. Interestingly enough, there were six big periods in there for the stock market in both directions. There were three big bull markets. From 1900 to 1921, the Dow went from 66 to 71, less than a 10% move in 20 years, less than half a percent a year. You got dividends too, but a half a percent, so it didn't move. From 21 to 29, it went from 71 to a high of 381 in September of 1929, went up 500%. Obviously, the, the well-being of the country didn't go up 500% during that period, and the well-being of the company, country went up a whole lot more than... 10% during that first 21 years. So he had this very uneven development. Then from September 1929 until the end of 1948, the Dow went from 381 to about 180. It was cut in half. And that was 18 long years. And yet the per capita GDP was moving right up during this whole period. So the economy was doing fine. From 48 to 65, the Dow went again from about 180 up to close to 1,000. Again, five for one, which was far outstripping it. From 65 to 81, the Dow went down, literally, per capita GDP. And then we've had this last period where it's gone up terrifically. If you take the whole 100 years, it went up 180 for one. Every $1,000 became 180,000. But 43 and three quarters years were those three big, huge bull markets, and 56 and a quarter years were periods of stagnation, all in an economy that was doing fine year after year. 56 and a quarter years, net the Dow was down a couple hundred points during that period, and the other 43 and three quarters years made up the rest of this move from 66 to 11,000, some on the Dow. You say to yourself, how could it be that you could have a country that was doing better and better and better? Citizens were living, every generation was living better than the one that preceded it, but you had these huge changes, big gains a few times, long periods of stagnation, 20 years, that's a long time to do nothing. Warren discusses investor psychology and why people behave the way that they do in stock markets. The answer is that investors behave in very human ways, which is they get very excited during bull markets and they look in the rearview mirror and they say, I made money last year, I'm gonna make more money this year, so this time I'll borrow. Or the neighbor says, I wasn't in last year when that neighbor was dumber than I, I made a lot of money, so I'm gonna go in this year. So they're always looking in the rearview mirror. And when they look in the rearview mirror and they see a lot of money having been made in the last few years, they plow in and they just push and push on prices. And when they look in the rearview mirror and they see no money having been made, they just say, this is a lousy place to be. So they don't care what's going on in the underlying business. And it's astounding, but that makes for a huge opportunity. Just huge opportunity. I've lived through roughly half, in an investing sense, about half that period. And I've had that long period of stagnation from 65, to 82, 17 years. I wrote an article for Forbes in 1979. I just said, how can this be? Pension funds in 1970 put a hundred and some percent of their new money in stock because they were wild about stocks. Then they got a lot cheaper and they put a record low in, 9% of their net new money in 1978 when stocks were way cheaper. People behave very peculiarly in terms of their reactions because they're human beings and they get excited when others get excited, they get greedy when others get greedy, they get fearful when others get fearful and they'll continue to do so. You will see things you won't believe in your lifetime and securities markets. And the country will do very well over time, but you will see these huge waves. And if you can stay objective throughout that, if you can detach yourself temperamentally from the crowd, 
you get very rich and you won't have to be very bright. It doesn't take brains, it takes temperament. It takes the ability to sit there and look at something. When I started out in 1950, I would go through and find things at two times earnings and they were perfectly decent businesses and people wanted jobs at those companies and everybody knew they were gonna be around and they wouldn't buy them at two times earnings and that's when interest rates were two and a half percent. I started selling securities when I was 21 and a Kansas City Life Insurance Company happened to be a fairly prominent company in Omaha and the policies they sold you if you were buying life insurance from them had a built-in assumption of 2% interest. The stock of Kansas City Life was selling at less than three times earnings. You were getting 35% if you bought the stock. No question about the soundness of the company. I went to the local agent. I figured, hell, I ought to be able to sell him a few shares of stock. I mean, the guy ought to understand it. He's got his whole life invested in this company. I went to the local agent who'd been with him for 20 years. His name was Moose. And I said, Mr. Moose, you're selling these policies with 2%. You may even have a few members of your own family, and you can buy into this company whose paycheck you depend on every month and whose future your beneficiaries of these life policies depend on and who you're selling them, you know, a 2% investment on, and you get 35% on your money. He said, you know, stocks aren't any good. I couldn't sell the other. I was a lousy salesman. Well, you have to start with that, but it just blew me away. It blew me away. Sometimes I used to wonder if I was nuts. The same thing happened in 19... 64, the Dow closed at 864. At the end of 1981, 17 years later, it closed at 865. It moved one point in 17 years. Now, that's not a big move. And you can't believe how discouraged people were during that period. People were living better. So things can go on a long time that don't make sense. But they do come to an end. The internet thing, you had these companies selling for many billions of dollars that had no, really practically no prospects of making any money. That's a bubble. But Herb Stein one time said, anything that can't go on forever will end. Now that seems pretty uh, But think about that. Particularly think about it next time you're trying to do something just because the stock's gone up a whole lot and your neighbors made money or something. You just have to sit and think objectively and think about, would I buy this whole business? If it's an internet company, it's got 100 million shares out and selling at 100, that's $10 billion. Is it worth $10 billion? If it's worth $10 billion, it's got to be able to give you seven or 800 million next year. And if it doesn't give you seven or eight hundred million next year, <clears throat> it has to give you maybe 10% more than that the year after and continue to be. There aren't a lot of businesses that can do that. And people just go crazy. And of course, it's fun. It's like that sign they put in brokers offices that says, avoid hangovers, stay drunk. You know, it's just so much fun to keep playing. But you gotta do sensible things to get good results. Warren explains his criteria for selling stocks and the circumstances in which he would consider selling one of his holdings. When I started out, I had way more ideas than money. I mean, I would go through Moody's manual. I went through it page by page, and then I went through it again page by page. And I found stocks in there that I could understand that were selling at like two times earnings, even one times earnings. When you only have 10,000 bucks, that, that can get a little frustrating. And, and, and if you don't like to borrow money, which I never like to borrow money, so I was always coming up with more ideas than I had money. So I had to sell whatever I liked least to buy something new that just was compelling to me. And for a long time, I was in that mode. And now our problem is we have more money than ideas. If you look at our annual report, which is on the internet under at our homepage, BerkshireHathaway.com, you'll see something in the back called the economic principles of Berkshire. And you will see, which I believe in setting out for my partners. They are my partners. I don't look at them as shareholders. I look at them as partners. They're going to be my partners for life. So I want to tell them how I think. And if they don't disagree with the way I think, that's fine, but I don't want them to, I don't want to be disappointed in me. I lay out there and I say, in terms of our wholly owned businesses, we're not going to sell no matter how much anybody offers. If somebody offers us three times what something is worth, at Seas Candy, the Buffalo News, Borsheims, whatever it may be, we're not going to sell it. I may be wrong in having that approach. I know I'm not wrong if I owned 100% of Berkshire because that's the way I want to live my life. I've got all the money I could possibly need. It just amounts to a change in the newspaper story on my obituary and the amount of money that the foundation has. And to break off relationships with people I like and people that have joined me because they think it's a permanent home, to do that simply because somebody waves a big check at me would be like selling one of my children because somebody waved a big check. So I won't do that. And I want to tell my partners I won't do it so that they're not disappointed in me. More and more, with certain stocks, we've got that approach. Now, if we were chronically short of funds and had all kinds of opportunities coming, we might have a somewhat different approach. But our inclination is not to sell things unless we get really discouraged, perhaps, with the management 
or we think the economic characteristics of the business change in a big way, and that happens. But we're not going to sell simply because it looks too high, in, in all likelihood. You can't make that 100%, but that's the principle under which we're operating. We're generating right now five billion of cash a year at least so it's a hundred million bucks every week and uh, you know just not we've been talking here half an hour and i haven't done a damn thing and the real question is how do you put it out intelligently and, and if we were selling things it'd be just that much more so there may come a time when that would change i have partners shareholders partners who would say if you can get three times what sees candy's worth why don't you sell it and that's why i want to be sure before they come in they know how i think on that they're entitled to know that think for a minute if you're going to get married and you'll want a marriage that's going to last. Not necessarily the happiest marriage, or one that, that Martha Stewart will talk about or anything, but you want a marriage that's gonna last. What quality do you look for in a spouse? One quality. Do you look for brains? Do you look for humor? Do you look for character? Do you look for beauty? No. You look for low expectations. That is the marriage that's gonna last. You both have low expectations. And I want my partners to be on the low side on expectations coming in because I want the marriage to last. It's a financial marriage when they join me at Berkshire and I don't want them to think I'm going to do things that I'm not going to do. So that's our guiding principle. The advice is all free and your marital advice, everything else. If you found value in this video, please like the video and let us know what other topics we should make a video about next.